Shortly after midnight, on July the 29th this year, the motor cruiser Sunbird 6 entered the River Thames and, passing through a customs check, she anchored further upriver. The yellow quarantine flag was flown to indicate she had arrived from a foreign port and required formal customs clearance. At first light, Sunbird 6 was boarded by officers of HM Customs and Excise, headed by preventive officer John Welby. They found the vessel to be in the sole charge of Paul Brandon Vennings, a 20-year-old economics student. Vennings stated he had just motored across the channel from Cherbourg and had nothing dutiable to declare. The officers were not satisfied and commenced a search of the vessel. They examined the engine compartment, the fuel and water tanks, the bilges and life jackets, until Officer Welby, checking the cabin, noticed a newly fitted panel. The panel was removed and a total of two kilos of refined heroin, worth not less than £200,000 on the black market, was found hidden beneath the locker. That evening, Paul Vennings was charged by the police with offences under the Dangerous Drugs Act of 1965 and with attempting to smuggle two kilos of refined heroin. At 10.45am next morning, William Asquith Vennings was charged with being an accessory to the crimes of his son. Both father and son pleaded not guilty. And so you searched the Sunbird 6? Yes, sir. We found a total of two kilos of refined heroin concealed between the port bulkheads. Not quite so fast as Mr. Welby. You found two plastic packages. Like those, please. That's right. Those are the packets. Exhibit number two, my lord. A laboratory analysis later confirmed that these packages contain heroin of a type currently being refined in Marseille and known as Chinese heroin. I have here the agreed statement from the forensic laboratory at New Scotland Yard, my lord. Exhibit number three. Mm. <coughs> well, Mr. Welby, I represent Mr. Paul Bennings in this case. I would like to ask you, first of all, about the circumstances of the arrival of the Sunbird 6 in the Thames River. Yes, sir. Uh, did my client observe the correct procedures for the arrival of a vessel from a foreign port? He did, sir, yes. He was flying the yellow duster. Uh, the yellow duster? It's the uh, international quarantine flag, sir. Oh, yes, sir. And he moored alongside. And so there was nothing furtive or suspicious about his behaviour? No, sir. And uh, when you discovered these packets of Chinese heroin, uh, how would you describe the young man's reaction? Oh, sir, he was um, surprised, I suppose, sir. Surprised? Your discovery came as a complete shock to him. Well, I wouldn't say that. Oh, Mr. Welby, either he was surprised at your discovery or he was not surprised. Either he uh, knew the stuff was there or, as you have just implied, it was a complete surprise to him. He was surprised. Yes. But by that I don't mean to... Oh, thank you, Mr. Welby. So the Sunbird 6 arrived in a perfectly routine manner without the slightest attempt to evade your inspection. And yet you turn up with a team of your fellow officers and despite assurances that there is nothing dutiable on board, you are not satisfied and you commence an exceedingly thorough search. Now, why was this, Mr. Welby? Is it what I believe is termed um, a snap search? No, sir. We had reason to suspect drug running. You had reason? What reason? We were acting on information received, sir. Well, I see you were tipped off in advance. By whom were you tipped off? With respect, sir, I'm not at liberty to divulge that. Not at liberty? My client stands accused of the most serious charges, oh, and you the say officer that officer rightly wishes to protect his informant. And my learned friend is surely aware of established precedent. Mr. Welby is under no obligation to reveal the identity. Quite so, Mr. Elliot. Thank you. Thank you, my lord. Well, I stand corrected, my lord. However, whilst accepting that you wish to preserve the anonymity of your informant, uh, may we ask whether this mystery man or woman received payment for his services? No. 
or whether he was previously known to you or your offices. Well, I assume he was, since otherwise you would hardly be expected to act so thoroughly on his information. My lord. We'd act on information from a child, sir. We thought there was a chance of nailing a drug smuggler. I represent Mr. Venning Sr. in this case, Mr. Welby. You have already testified that Paul Vennings was the only person on board the Sunbird 6 when she arrived from France. Yes, sir. Did you see Mr. Vennings Sr. on that occasion, after the young man was taken ashore and charged, or at any time during that day? This is the gentleman in question. No, sir. Not on that day. Was any reference made to him during the events of July the 29th last? Not in my hearing, sir, no, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Welby. That's all. That concludes the case for the prosecution, my lord. My lord, in view of the unusual circumstances of this case, I should like to call my client to give evidence at this juncture. If Mr. Fry agrees. I do, my lord, but uh, with the reservation that Mr. Vennings may be called as a defence witness later on. Have you any objections, Mr. Elliot? None, my lord. Hmm. Uh, very well, Mr. Castle. Thank you, my lord. <coughs> Call William Asquith <coughs> Vennings. William Asquith Vennings. What's your name, please? Church of England. Will you take the book in your right hand, Smith? I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You are William Asquith Vennings of the Beaches, Belgrave Road, Fulchester. I am. Mr. Vennings, is the motor cruiser Sunbird 6 the property of the Gaines Finance Company? Yes. And are you chairman and managing director of that company? Yes, I am. Now, is it a fact that you had reserved the vessel for your own personal use during the month of July last? I had, yes. So that you were technically responsible to the company for the boat at the time of the uh, alleged offence? Technically, I was, yes. Were you on board Sunbird 6 at any time on July the 29th last? No. Were you on board Sunbird 6 at any time during the crossings to and from Cherbourg, or whilst the boat was lying at Cherbourg? No. Where were you at all those times? Oh, very much on dry land, at home and at work. Was the boat taken to Cherbourg with your permission? Well, no, no. I mean, I had no idea what the boy was up to. By the boy, I take it you refer to your son, Paul. <laughs> you are saying you were not responsible for this journey because it was undertaken without your permission? In these circumstances, no, my lord, I was Mr. not. Mr. Bennings, it is these circumstances I am attempting to clarify. Well, simply, I, I didn't know he was off in the boat at all. You didn't know? Do I understand you to be telling me that, in effect, your son had stolen the boat that weekend in June? Well, my lord, I wouldn't put it quite like that. Well, how would you put it, Mr. Bennett? Did you give him permission, or did you not? No, no, I, I didn't. Now, then, in effect, your son lord, had stolen... I'm simply saying that Paul knew I wouldn't be using the boat during that week, so he took off in her, that's all. Ah, thank you, Mr. Vennings. But without your permission? Yes. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> now, Mr. Vitt, would you excuse me for one moment, please? <clears throat> well, Lord, in order to save the court's time, in view of the evidence we've just heard, the prosecution do not wish to press the charges against Mr. William Vennings. Quite so. Now, members of the jury, Mr. Elliott has indicated that the prosecution does not intend to press the charges against Mr. William Asquith Vennings. Accordingly, you will follow my directions and find him not guilty of the charges. You will please stand, Foreman, and say not guilty. Not guilty. Thank you. <clears throat> May leave the box, Mr. Vennings. Uh, oh, uh, like one moment before you uh, go, Mr. Vennings. <coughs> you may be recalled later as a witness, so please hold yourself within the precincts of the court. And also, do not speak to any other witness 
on anything you have said or heard said during this case today. Very well, my lord. Thank you. You may leave the box. Thank you. <coughs> May it please your lordship. Members of the jury. On the 29th of July last, two kilos of Chinese heroin valued at 200,000 pounds on the black market were discovered on board a motor cruiser, which was in the sole charge of the accused, Paul Venix. Now, no one is disputing this fact. The drugs were there, cleverly concealed for the obvious purpose of being smuggled into this country. What is in dispute is the question of who hid them there. Was it, as the prosecution alleged, Paul Vennings? Well, if it was, there are a good many inconsistencies to be explained. You will see for yourselves that he is a frank, well-orientated young man with all the benefits of a good home, devoted parents, and an exclusive education behind him. A very far cry indeed from the squalid and degrading circumstances that so commonly give rise to delinquency. But if Paul Vennings did not hide the drugs, then who did? Well, members of the jury, I would ask you con to consider these facts. The drugs were Chinese heroin. They had been processed, packaged, and concealed on the boat in a most professional manner. In short, members of the jury, this was not the work of an amateur, not the work of a young man still at college. It was, I submit, part of a vast operation, beginning in Asia, ending in Soho, and organized and executed by skilled professional smugglers. Now, members of the jury, I would like you to consider this. It is our submission that these smugglers selected just one English boat from among the many that lay in Cherbourg Harbor, as they must have done on many other occasions. They slipped on board and hid the drugs, just as they would have slipped on board again to retrieve them once the boat was safely across in the River Thames, except that someone betrayed them. It was the presence of the drugs that was betrayed, members of the jury, not Paul Vennings. He was the innocent victim caught in the midst of it all. The criminal of today is organized, he's ruthless, and he does not take risks. He picks upon decent, unwitting citizens like Paul Vennings to take those risks for him. Mary Elizabeth Bennings. Mary Elizabeth Bennings. What is your urgent news? Oh, judge me. You take the book in your right hand and swear the oath. Thank you. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. So, Mrs. Fennings, you're saying that the suggestion that your son was engaged in smuggling was wildly out of character. Oh, more. Much more. I mean, it's impossible. We, uh, well, perhaps because he's our only child, Paul and I have always been very close. Particularly with... Uh, yes, uh, Mrs. Fennings? Uh, well, with his father, always so busy on his business affairs, you know. Quite so. Paul isn't like a lot of the youngsters of today with their wretched demos and their pop, this, that and the other, and their permissiveness. Oh no. No, he, he'd much rather be off on his own, quietly getting on with things, uh, studying and so forth, you know. Thank you, Mrs. Jennings. Mrs. Jennings. Oh, you're obviously a very proud mother. <laughs> It's natural that you see your son in a favorable light. Yes. As you say, you're very close. Your only child, your husband away a lot. In fact, it must have been very difficult over the years not to spoil him. After all, there was never any shortage of money, whatever he wanted. Oh, we've always tried to give him a proper sense of money values. He's had a set allowance just like any other child. And his allowance, now he's at college? 
Oh, a moderate one, yes. Moderate compared with what you could afford to give him? Moderate compared with what some of them get. Has he asked for more? For a larger allowance? No. Well, what about a lump sum? And didn't he ask you recently for several hundred pounds? Money that would enable him to finance um, a trip, an overland trip to Asia during the summer vacation. Oh, yes, he asked. But you refused. Yes, I did. How did he take it, your refusal? Wasn't he upset about it? Didn't you, in fact, have quite a row about it? Oh, no. No hard words, no disagreement? Yes, but that was about the idea of the trip, <laughs> not about the money. I see. You didn't want him going off. It was perfectly understandable. Away overseas, Land Rovers, Kabul, Benares, Nepal, the Asian drug tour. No, no, I didn't. Is that so strange? Well, at least he came and asked me, which is more than most of them would have done these days. Well, surely they'd ask, madam. They'd get down on their knees and beg if they needed money for a trip. My learned friend has described the accused as a, as a frank person. You would agree with that? Completely. He's not in the habit of deceiving you? Oh, certainly not. And not even about his activities at college with no. his fellow students, no? Uh, you claim just now that he... he disdained their wretched demos, their pop this and that, and their permissiveness. And naturally you wish this, but is it true? Well, I, I should know my own son. Yes, you should, madam. As he should know you. So he has never, to your knowledge, attended a student demonstration? No. Nor been gated for attending particularly wild parties or sit-ins? No. Mrs. Vennings, this is an important question. To your knowledge, has Paul ever used drugs? To my knowledge, no. No. Now, you've been at pains to assure us that Paul is a good, indeed, even a model son. How about yourself? Would you say you've been a good mother? Well, I've always tried my best, naturally. Your best? Do you take tranquilizers, Mrs. Vennings? Well, yes, I have had some prescribed. I have to put it to you, madam, that perhaps your best is not very good. Were you, on the 3rd of March, 1970, convicted of driving whilst drunk? Yes. Uh, did you plead not guilty? Yes, I did. So you went into the witness box, you took the oath, and you denied that you'd been drinking anything? Yes. yes. You were disbelieved on your oath and found guilty? Yes. Yes. Following conviction on charges of drunken driving. Earlier this year, did you attend the Hapsworth, Hapsworth Clinic near Solihull for treatment? Yes or no, Mrs. Vennings? Yes. What treatment? I... It was a special diet. Very special, madam. Specifically, it excluded alcohol. My lord, with respect, an advocate must be allowed to develop his examination. But when it becomes clear that it is not directed to an issue in the case, it is time for him to be stopped. My learned friend appears to be trying to make out a case against a witness. Well, Mr. Eddy. Lord, I'm endeavouring to show that Far from giving the accused the attentive moral care which she has claimed, this lady has, by her example, exposed him to her own brand of permissiveness. Yes. Well, I think we can agree that you've gone far enough with that line. Thank you, Mrs. Vennings. Thank you, Mrs. Vennings. That will be all. Now, Lord, I should like to call a third character witness prior to calling the accused to give evidence. I believe Mr... Elliot will have no objection. Not at all, my lord. Very well. Call Jennifer Alison Harley. Jennifer Alison Harley. Church of England. You take the right hands with you. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. You are um, Jennifer Alison Harley, and you live at 54 Grange Road, Renton. Yes. You are 20 years of age, and you're a student at St John's College, Renton. I am. Miss Harley, 
Were you a friend of the accused, Paul Benny? I am. That is a, an engagement ring you're wearing, I believe. Yes, Paul and I were engaged last week. Congratulations. May we take this as an instance of your feelings towards his alleged crimes? My feelings? Well, you seem to me to be a sensible young woman. Hard at the time I would have thought to commit yourself to marrying a criminal faced with a potentially severe prison sentence. Paul's no criminal. Thank you, Miss Harley. How long is it since you first met Paul? About seven or eight months, I suppose. And during that time, have you had any reason Look, to Mr. feel... Look, Mr. Fry, I'm sorry, but this isn't uh, what it's about. If you don't I'm... mind, I will ask the questions, Miss Harley. I know Paul's innocent because I was there with him. Oh. Oh. Silence in court. Silence. Well, if I'm here to tell the truth... Silence. Miss Harley, in his statement to the police, the accused claimed to have been alone when in Cherbourg Harbour. Yes, sir. He said he wanted to keep me out of it. Said there was no need. A chivalrous, if misguided, gesture. Yes, exactly. Well, Miss Harley, since you've taken it upon yourself to uh, correct a misunderstanding implied in his words, perhaps you'll tell us why you feel this means that he's not guilty. Yes, sir. We had four days together over there. In Cherbourg, that is. I was with Paul the whole time, every minute, day and night. I watched him leave the harbour on the 29th. Uh, not so fast, please, Miss Harley. This is very important. Yes? At no time could Paul get hold of the heroin without me knowing, much less hidden it on board. Thank you, Miss Harley. Well, there's more. Of what nature, Miss Harley? Well, you see, I think I know how the heroin got there. It was planted deliberately while, by, while we were ashore, planted by some, some nutter with a thing against Paul. Paul may be weak, but he's certainly not stupid. In the case of the Queen versus Vennings, a 20-year-old economic student, Paul Vennings, has been accused of smuggling heroin in his father's motor cruiser, Sunbird 6. Jennifer Harley, Vennings' fiancé, yesterday insisted that he couldn't possibly have acquired and concealed the two kilos of refined heroin without her knowing, because they had been together day and night. The court heard how an anonymous caller tipped off customs officers about the heroin being on board. Jonathan Fry QC, in his main defence plea, claimed Venims was the victim of a scheme run by professionals who selected the Sunbird 6 for smuggling heroin to England. Called as a character witness, Mrs Mary Venings described Paul as a model son. But, revealing that the mother had a serious drink problem, the prosecution counsel, Mr James Elliott, accused her of exposing the son to her own brand of permissiveness. And would you agree with your wife? that Paul is by way of being a model, son. Well, hardly that perfect. We've certainly done our best by him, of course. Your best? Well, to keep him trim, right thinking and disciplined. If that's model by today's standards, well. <laughs> yes. May we infer then that you deplore the general drift of morality in the young? Indeed I do. Do you approve of stand penalties aimed at curbing drug abuse? Yes, I'd like to see the law a lot tougher than it is tougher, even in the case of this young man whom you've sought to keep trim, right thinking and disciplined? If he were found to be guilty, in that case, then naturally he should face the full punishment, naturally. I'm sure your son will appreciate that. Mr. Vennings, you're an astute and successful man of business. Hmm. A success bought, no doubt, at much cost of time and effort. Oh, I suppose so, yes. It costs too to your domestic life? Oh, hardly. Oh, your wife and her evidence made no bones about the extent to which your work dominates your life. Yes, nevertheless, I've always tried. Tried? Right? I put it to you, sir, that over the years you've grossly neglected your duties as a father. And I say that is grossly unfair. Grossly. It would. But please tell the court who has briefed and is paying for the defence of your son. Well, my wife. Your wife. Who stood bail for your son? You or your wife? 
All right, my wife, who happens to have considerable private means of her own, but if she hadn't done it first, I should. What would you say? I wonder. I put it to you, sir, that this issue of who pays <coughs> is indicative of your whole attitude. Mr. Bennings, do you like your son? Do I like him? Yes, I also put it to you, sir, that you're totally out of sympathy with your son and his predicament in this court. What, not? And that's because you believe him to be guilty and you, as you put it, for the full punishment. Oh, now, look here, you're not allowed to see. It is for the jury to decide whether the accused is guilty or not. I stand properly corrected, my lord. Quite so. All done. Thank you, my lord. You may stand down, Mr. Benny. Thank you, my lord. Now, with your lordship's permission, I'd like to call the accused Paul Brandon Benning. Very well. Paul Brandon Benning. Touch me. Take a look in your right hand and swear yes. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Uh, you are Paul Brandon Venning. Yes. And you live at the Beaches, Belgrave Road, Fulcher, sir. That's right. <coughs> now, Mr. Venning, I would like to ask you about this Land Rover trip that you were planning to take to Asia. First of all, um, who did you intend to go with? A couple of friends of mine who were in the same year at college. And what was the purpose of the expedition? Our plan for the expedition was to study the social adjustments occurring in the peasant economies of Afghanistan, Kashmir and the rural Punjab. Really? Doesn't sound like the grand Asian drug tour described by the prosecution. Oh, no. It, uh, the trip, that is, it was a sort of extension of our course at St John's. At the college? Well, as we've already heard from the witness, Miss Harley, you take your studies extremely seriously. Well, you are, in fact, the very opposite of the demo-prone, hot-head student radical which the prosecution has tried to insinuate. Well, they're the minority at St John's, anyway. Indeed. Now, Mr Vennings, it has been established that your fiancée, Miss Harley, was, in fact, on board the Sunbird Six with you on the dates of the 25th, 26th, 27th and 28th of July. Have you anything to say to the court about this? Your Lordship, I would like to apologise to the court for what I now see as a rash and, and misguided action. Uh, Miss Harley was with me, and I should have said so in my deposition to the magistrates. Hmm. Rash indeed, young man. Perjury, in fact. Yes, sir. My Lord, the defence has endeavoured to suggest the motive of chivalry here. Uh, whether or not this is so is still open to question. It is indeed, Mr Elliot. Thank you, my Lord. Mr Fry. Thank you, my Lord. Now, um, Mr Bennings, why did you take the Sunbird Six to Cherbourg in July? I wanted to take Jenny. She'd never been across the channel in a small boat before. You see. Now, you took her across, but she did not make the return journey. Why was this? Well, she was seasick on the way out. The forecast was dodgy for the 29th, so I thought it best... To get her to fly back, Mark. Yes. Actually. And is this why, having motored across to Cherbourg on the 25th of July, you kept the boat in the harbour until the morning of the 29th? Uh, well, there was also the engine. Well, you had uh, mechanical trouble? Yes, the gearbox was sticking. She'd lost reverse. I see. So the Sunbird was laid up for repairs? Yes. Well, we could still uh, live on board, but we didn't actually use her until... Uh, well, actually, it was the day before, the 28th. We took her out for a short test run. These, uh, these repairs, were, were they all done by the same firm? Yes, by Comiers, the local marine engineers. Comiers. So you and Miss Harley were living on board the Sunbird 6, but did you go ashore on any occasion? Yes. Leaving only the Comiers mechanics working on board? Well, the harbour master's office looked after the keys, while we weren't there, that is. I see. So there were occasions when the Sunbird Six was unoccupied and even unlocked while she was in Cherbourg Harbour? Yes, occasionally. Oh. Well, thank you, Mr. Benning. The weather on the 29th was exceptionally fine. It was, in fact, midway through the summer's first really warm spell. The forecast was not, as you put it, <coughs> dodgy. Um, your reason for not taking Miss Harley with you, could it be that in this instance your chivalrous concern for her was nothing to do with seasickness on a virtually becalmed English channel, but rather the risk of getting caught smuggling drugs? It... Yes? It doesn't have to be rough to get ill. Well, the mere suggestion, you mean, can be enough for some people. Yes. 
Miss Harley didn't strike me as being a particularly suggestible person, however. It's been claimed that you are a frank, well-orientated young man, right-thinking and disciplined, a model son. Does that fit with your image of yourself? I try to be. You try? Yeah. Wouldn't you say in reality that you're a rather furtive sort of person, inclined to deceit and generally disliked by your fellow students? Well... Do we take that to mean you agree you're furtive and no, deceitful? No, of course not. No. When did you last get your hair cut? Well, these questions are irrelevant and prejudicial. Can we come to the point, Mr. Elliot? If I'm allowed to continue, my lord. Very well, Mr. Elliot. Thank you, my lord. Mr. Venix, please tell the jury when you last got your hair cut. Last week. So as to get it nice and tidy for this trial? I suppose so. You wore it shoulder length and shaggy before then, did you not? Yes. Yes. So you had your hair cut a week ago, so as to present yourself to this jury as a different person to the person that you really are. How about your fiance, Miss Harley? She like your hair like that? Yes. Does she? You'll be telling us next that your parents approve of your engagement to her. Not particularly. Please speak up so the jury can hear you. He said his parents did not particularly care for his engagement to Miss Harley. Oh, um, is that why you felt it necessary to sneak off with her in the Sunbird Six without telling them? A model of some? Well, of course, no one could deny you're privileged. Big home garden, regular cash allowance, mini car, 40 foot motor cruiser. Some would even say spoilt, overindulged to the point where, when your mother refuses your money for your Asian expedition, you fly off into a rage and start smuggling heroin so as to finance it that way. No! No, no, what? No, you aren't spoilt? Uh, how about your being, uh, well orientated? Uh, you were sent as part of your exclusive education to Felhams, the public school near your home, correct? Yes. Where, although most of the boys are boarders, you attend as a, as a day boy, yes? Yes. What nickname did you have at Fellows? Oh, come on, everyone has a nickname, some sort of... Can't another. say that I did. You can't say? Perhaps I can refresh your memory. Smothers, wasn't it? Smothers, boy. After a few years, you were so well orientated, it became necessary for your parents to take you away from Fellows and send you to a special crammer's school, which would push you through enough A-levels to get you into St. John's, correct? What? What? I said after a few years, you became so well yes, oriented... Yes, all, all right. As to your relationship. Your mother has described you as a rather solitary person. Now, isn't it true that the reason you're not one of the activist students is that because you have difficulty in forming relationships? If you say so. Well, surely your fellow students have said so. Yeah? When they rejected you last winter from the student activist that, committee. That was... The Smothers Boy image is stuck, isn't it? They don't call me that. Or maybe you're just the poor little rich boy to them. Spurned, scorned and rejected. No. To such an extent that you have to buy their friendship, for instance, with offers to pay for their trips to Asia. No. no. Did they ask you to smuggle heroin? No. They dare you to smuggle heroin? No. Scorning your inadequacy, making use of you, exploiting you and above all despising you, even to the extent that one of them maliciously betrayed you. No. Betrayed your smuggling to the customs and excise. No. Who else will betray you? Why should they? Who else knew about the drugs? Mr. Bendings, have you ever smoked marijuana? No. Have you ever tried hashish? Um, Young man, I... you're under oath. Have you ever tried hashish? Now, what about Benny's? Speed. Ever tried Benny's? No. No. Have you? Oh, um, have you ever sniffed coke? Stop! Stop, stop it! it. Heroin. Are you oh, an addict, stop Mr. it! Benny's? Have you tried All right. heroin? Let, let's say I did it then. I'm guilty. Oh, oh, come on. Silence! Come on. Will you pull yourself together, Young? Man? If I might ask <coughs> for a short adjournment. Very well, if uh, Mr. Elliot agrees. On the contrary, my lord, if the accused wishes to change his plea to guilty. Very well. <laughs> The Lord, there is of course no question of a change of plea. My client has quite simply overwrought. He's a young man barely out of his teens, faced with the most serious criminal charges, distressed and frightened. No one has suggested that he's the brash, self-assured type of youngster. On the contrary, he's at the most 
difficult testing age when he will be exceptional indeed not to feel insecure and deeply sensitive to the kind of vicious criticism to which my learned friend has subjected him. Your Lord, the time for speeches is later. Quite so. Suffice it to say that Bendings is still pleading not guilty, Mr. Fry. Thank sir. you. If your Lordship would excuse me for one moment. Um, with your Lordship's permission, um, <coughs> we had at this point intended to ask for a short adjournment to the indisposition of a crucial witness. But it seems that we have at last managed to secure his presence. And so, with your permission, um, I would like to call Epel Gastar. Very well. I swear by Almighty God, the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. You are Epel Gestar of 15 Rue Saint Jean, Cherbourg? Yes, sir. And you are regularly employed as an assistant harbour master in Cherbourg? Yes, sir. Monsieur Gastar, do you know this young man? Yes, sir, I have seen him with Sunbelt CCM in our yacht pool. In Cherbourg? Oui, monsieur. And when was this? Uh, the last week, July. And was he alone on board? I think, forgive me, I, I think uh, Monsieur Vennings had the Mamselle Anglaise with him. Yes, of course, Miss Harley, to whom he's now engaged to be married. Alors, c'est bien ça. <laughs> Monsieur Gastar, uh, did the Sunbird 6 have engine trouble when in harbour? Uh, there was a fault with the... Uh, the carte. Eh? Gearbox? Oui, yes, gearbox. Two, three days with mechanics working uh, and on the server. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, uh, before we come on to that, I'd like to ask you what, um, what arrangements did Mr. Vennings have when he and Miss Harley wished to go ashore? Uh, arrangements, sir. Uh, 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 the key. Uh, always if they go for a long time, uh, they leave the key with our bureau. And then, of course, we, uh, we keep open eyes for the people going to his boat. People? Well, sometimes stealing, uh, equipment de navigation, uh, whiskey, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, monsieur. And um, did you, in fact, see any, any other persons uh, visit uh, Sunbird 6? We, during we the, the, the third day, day, the 28th July. I'm just going for le midi dinner. Yes, I, I see this man going on board. You didn't challenge him? No, he, he was in... Comment on dit bleu de travail? Overalls. Oh, oui, overalls a mechanic. Uh, he carried the gold metal box for tools. Naturellement, I think he is fixing gearbox. Uh, specialist, peut-être. But you had reason later to doubt this. Uh, I see the two mechanics of Monsieur Cormier at Le Mer Noir. Uh, Bisto, who marche. Uh, they say they fix already. Finished job. So then you became suspicious, curious about this strange mechanic. Uh, peut-être he fixed something else. Peut-être he is a charpentier or electrics man. Uh, eh bien, I say to myself, I will check. I will be sure. But after the dinner, the man, he is gone. And Monsieur Paul is already back with the mademoiselle. They are making no uh, outrage, no, no fuss. Nothing is stolen, alors. I keep it shut. Well, when did you uh, open it again? Uh, last month. There is coming the English detective. He asks questions, I remember. I tell how it passes with this man on 28 July. So this man who went on board, now he, he was alone? Oui, monsieur. And he carried a large toolbox? Uh, so long, huh? And you're certain it was the Sunbird 6 he boarded and that you saw no one else on board? Absolutely. Thank you, Monsieur. Monsieur. Monsieur Gaston. Monsieur. This, uh, this detective who came to question you last month, was he a policeman? Uh, no, no, sir. I think uh, Detective Privé. A private detective? Yeah. Employed by our client's solicitor, my lord, uh, Mr. Wilson. A private detective employed by the defense. Uh, this mechanic of whom you were suspicious, did you, um, did you mention seeing him to anyone else at that time? One of your colleagues, for instance? <laughs> I have said there was no outrage, nothing was stolen. Uh, I presume he was as I have thought. Monsieur, did you mention seeing him to anyone else at that time? No, monsieur. No, thank you. A carpenter or an electrician? With this I have presumed. So. The private detective, hired by the defense, turns up last month. You conveniently recall your suspicions. You remembered the mystery man in the overalls with the big box. Uh, monsieur, my English uh, ah, desires... No more questions, my lord. Thank you. Thank you, Monsieur Gaston.
The court is indebted to you for coming all this way from your country to give your evidence. It is nothing, sir. For truth, man goes even to the moon. Huh? Uh, yeah, quite. Uh, well, thank you. You may stand up. Monsieur. Um, with your Lordship's permission, I should like at this point to recall the witness Jennifer Allison Harley. Very well. You will remember you are still under oath, Miss Harley. Yes. Miss Harley, I would like to ask you about the activities you went through on the day of 28th July last. Now, would you try to recall them for us as accurately as possible? Yes, sir. That was the morning we went to saint vaas le hmm? a fishing place roughly east of Cherbourg. We caught the early bus back about midday to Cherbourg. And what time did you get back to the boat? About one-ish, one-thirty. Was there anybody working on the boat when you got there? We half expected them to still be there, but they had finished and gone. By they, who do you mean? Uh, the two engineers who had been fixing the engine. And you're absolutely sure there was no one else about? Absolutely. And then, as I say, we took the boat out for a test run. Thank you, Miss Harley. This test run, Miss Harley. How long was it? About an hour or so. About an hour or so. Did you enjoy it? <laughs> yes. You didn't get seasick? Me? As you had on the crossing from England. The crossing? Uh, I wasn't seasick on the way across. Silence in court. Miss Harley, I'd like you to tell the court why it was that having motored across with the accused, Having lived aboard the Sunbird 6 for four days, you decided to fly home and left the accused to make the return journey alone. We, uh, we had a row. Had a row? What about Miss Harley? Could it have been about the drugs he was planning to smuggle? No! Hadn't you found out? Were you not pleading with him? No! I must remind you, Miss Harley, you're under oath, committed to the truth. It was because of the baby. Silence. What, baby? We hadn't long realized that I was pregnant. But I was uptight as hell about it. I told Paul there was nothing doing, that I'd have to have a, an abortion. He wouldn't hear of it. Kept saying how right it was and how great, how we'd get married. We argued half the night about it, over and over. Mm -hmm. and then finally on the 29th, I took off. Thank you. Excuse me, are you, are you pregnant now? Does that mean yes? Yes. Thank you. Uh, no more questions, Mark. Witness may stand down. Uh, that, my lord, concludes the case for the defence. My lord, there are further matters I wish to put to the accused, and accordingly I ask for him to be recalled. Yes, Mr. Elliot. I also like to be sure that all available evidence is before the court. Of course, but. Uh, Perhaps you will put your application in the morning. I will decide then. Lord will rise. I was waiting for him outside and he came up and yelled that he's had enough. He's run for it. Run out on the whole thing.
Paul Vennings, the 20-year-old student, accused of smuggling two kilos of refined heroin worth £200,000 on the black market in the motor cruiser Sunbird 6, may have jumped his bail at the end of the trial's second day. Under cross-examination, Vennings had broken down in the witness box. Described by the prosecution as furtive, inadequate, deceitful and disliked by his fellow students, the accused decided to change his plea to guilty. After an adjournment, however, this was retracted. The assistant harbourmaster from Cherbourg was called to testify about a mysterious mechanic seen boarding the Sunbird 6, a man whom the defence claim must have been responsible for planting the heroin. Recalled for re-examination, Venning's fiancée, Miss Jennifer Harley, admitted she and the accused had a row on their last day together in Cherbourg over the discovery that she was pregnant. Her evidence, coming at the end of the day's hearing, visibly distressed the accused. But whether he will in fact reappear to face the charges of drug smuggling remains to be seen. Mr. Elliot, will you please proceed? Lord, in view of the fact that the defendant is not present, may I ask for a warrant for his arrest? Uh, perhaps, Your Lordship, might feel it appropriate to hear from the parents and Miss Harley, as I understand they have something to say that is material as to the whereabouts of the accused. Hmm. Very well. Uh, call the parents and Miss Harley. Put them into the jury box, please. <coughs> Miss Harley, please join Mr. and Mrs. Vennings in the jury box. <coughs> and now then, I realize that the police have been questioning you on where your son might have gone to. But it might be helpful to the court to know why he has gone. You understand? Yes, my lord. But well, perhaps we can start with you, Mr. Bennings. Yes. Uh, no, don't stand up. It's all perfectly informal. Now, what do you think about it? Uh, well... You uh, may speak in perfect confidence, without prejudice. There is no record being set down. I see. Well, well, my lord, the fact is that... Well, Paul has done something of this nature once or twice before. Now, when was that? Well, for example, uh, he ran away from Milton Hall, didn't he? That's his crammers just before his A-level exams. Mm. He just lost his nerve, I suppose. He couldn't face it. Mm. Uh, you think this might be a similar sort of reaction? Well, presumably. He, um... Uh, yes, Mrs. Bennings? He's always tended to be rather highly strung, Your Worship. Yes. Nervous, you know. And then, when he started taking these pills at college... Pills? Yes, um, bennies or something, I think they called them. Anyway, they made him very excitable, and then sometimes he'd be very depressed. Are you suggesting that he may be under the influence of these drugs yesterday in this court? I don't know. Maybe. He's been terribly upset about the whole trial. Well, naturally, he would be. Do you agree with that, Miss Harley? No, sir. He kicked Benzedrin months ago. No thanks to her. And what's that supposed to mean? Mr. Vennings, if you uh, don't that know... That will be enough, young lady. I'm sorry, sir, but if Paul's in a mess, it's because of them. Oh, my God, you say that. You know, will you I'm kindly sad. sit down, Mr. Vennings? And you too, Miss Harley. Now, Miss Harley, would you care to tell us why you think he's gone away? He couldn't take any more. He'd had it. The whole thing got on top of him. I understand that he spoke to you yesterday. Immediately the court had adjourned. What did he say? Just that, really, that he'd had it. Nothing more? Well, he was all screwed up, in a state. He said nothing, for example, about betrayal. About? Well, uh, watching him yesterday in court, he seemed deeply shocked when you suggested that some personal enemy might have planted the drugs. Yes. And then again, when the officer gave the evidence about an informant, a tip-off. Yes, I knew about that. You knew about... You knew about the informant? How could you have known? You were not in court when the evidence was given. How could you know? Well, you see, what I meant The was... truth, please, Miss Harley. It was all a, a, a damn silly coincidence. It must have been. All right, so it was me who shocked him. Speak up, please, Miss Harley. You're telling us that it was you who informed against him? 
Yes, but... You knew that he was smuggling drugs? No, he wasn't. The heroin must have been put there by someone else. But I knew Paul was... was carrying. Carrying? I knew he had a couple of dozen joints with him. Marijuana cigarettes. I was with him when he bought them in Cherbourg. That's what we had the row about. You see, he was on just about everything when I first met him. Well and truly hooked. So anyway, I helped him. I got him to kick it. He was clean. At least I thought so until this thing about the pot in Cherbourg. And it was over this that you had the row? With the pregnancy. I told him it was stupid. I told him over and over. If he couldn't keep his word about jacking in pot, what hope was there in a future? And then what happened? He wouldn't agree. Kept saying pot was harmless enough and, and what the hell. So I went. I stormed off to Paris and caught a flight home. Then when I got back, all I could think of was I had to stop him. Somehow, someone had to. So I got this crazy idea that if, if Paul was caught with just a few joints like that, maybe it would make him see sense, get his priorities sorted, force things, you know. I love him. I'm, I'm carrying his child. You must see how I felt, why I did it, why I cared enough to do it. That's why he's gone. He knows. He knows I shocked him. Just one question, Miss Harley. You say you knew he had two dozen marijuana cigarettes. If that were so, why were they not also discovered during the extremely thorough customs and excise search? I asked him about that too, sir. He said that after I went, he got to thinking. He realized because of me, he'd have to kick it. So he dumped them over the side on the way back. And now, because of me... Young lady, you've told me all this in confidence. And I realize you may wish it to remain a confidence. However, I must urge you to go back into the witness box and tell the jury what you have told me. I'm sure that your lawyers, your fiancé's lawyers, will give you the same advice. Oh, I know. Not easy to confess the betrayal of your fiancé, whatever the circumstances. But you see, his running away like this has gravely prejudiced his, uh, his um, uh, defence. And I feel that if you go into the box and repeat in evidence exactly what you have told me, it may help him. All right? Mr. Fry. <clears throat> will you take your guidance, my lord? Very well. Will all three of you please go back into your seats? You may recall the jury. Members of the jury, I have to inform you that the accused Paul Vennings has absented himself and no one knows his real reason for doing so. In the normal course of events, I would adjourn this trial until such time as the whereabouts of the accused were established. But counsel on both sides are agreed that the trial should go on. And I see no overriding objection to such a course. Uh, Mr. Elliot was intending to recall uh, the accused, but he has already given his evidence. And Mr. Elliot tells me that under these circumstances, he is not averse to the trial continuing in the absence of the accused. In absentia, as it is called. <coughs> now then, a word about this situation. You may well feel that uh, the accused jumping his bail in this way is highly incriminating. But we do not know why he is not here. There may be many reasons. He may have met with an accident. Or he may have decided himself that he did not wish to attend. But even if that were the case, I should have to advise you that in itself, per se, it would not, it would not constitute an admission of guilt. Now, uh, do not misjudge me here. I, I am not directing you uh, not directing you to disregard the accused's absconding, merely urging you not to prejudge him on it. <clears throat> now, uh, 
Mr. Fry. Do you wish to recall Miss Harley in evidence? So afterwards, when I saw Paul on remand in Brixton, naturally I asked him why they hadn't found the pot as well. He said he'd dumped them over the well, side. Lord, I must object. This is hearsay evidence and as such totally inadmissible. But that's... No, I am afraid not. I must direct you to disregard the witness's last statement about what the accused may have said. Is that all you have to say to us, Miss Hart? If you say I can't tell them... You may not, Mr. Fry. Miss Harley, you may not tell us what Mr. Benning said. I'm sorry? You may only answer to the questions which are put to you. Now, Paul Benning set off for England with 24 marijuana cigarettes in his possession. Despite an exceedingly thorough search by the customs, these cigarettes were never found. What conclusions do you draw from this? Well, obviously, after I flew off like that... Uh, threatening, excuse me, well, threatening to have the pregnancy terminated if he failed to reform his attitude to pot. Exactly. After I stormed off like that, he had second thoughts. Reformed, as you say, and dumped the pot over the side. He must have, otherwise it would have been found. And by this same token, if he'd known about the two packets of Chinese heroin, would he have dumped that over the side also? Exactly, but I told you he couldn't have known. Precisely. Thank you, Miss Harley. Miss Harley, earlier in this trial, the defence was at pains to exploit you as a character witness. Now, for the accused to have such a sensible young woman as his fiance was clearly a strong point in his favour. In the light of what you have albeit belatedly confessed, it's obvious that your relationship was not the hearts and flowers image previously evoked by my learned friend. Miss Harley, can you remember the oath you took when you first went into that witness box? Yes. When you were recalled by my learned friend, his lordship reminded you of that oath. When I questioned you, I asked if the row you had with the accused was over the drugs he was planning to smuggle, and you answered no. Once again, you were reminded of your oath. And then with the timing of a seasoned performer, you told this court of the baby, cleverly avoiding the question. We now have it that when you first met the accused, he was well and truly hooked all round on all types of drugs. You decided to reform him and thought you had, you tell us, until you caught him planning to smuggle marijuana, correct? Well, yes. Yes. In desperation, you told him you were pregnant and threatened to have an abortion. I was pregnant. Were you, Miss Harley? Yes, I I'm engaged. We're marrying. Yes, but why? Because you're pregnant? Or because of your guilt in betraying him to the customs? No. I put it to you, Miss Harley, that you don't love the accused. Pity him, maybe, maybe, but not love. Because of your actions, you feel the least you can do is go through the motions of an engagement. No, I yes. care. Ah, exactly, you care. For your vanity. I put it to you that you're no more in love with the accused than you are pregnant by him. Are you pregnant, Miss Harley? You pregnant now? Please. You must answer the question. Are you pregnant, Miss Harley? No. Do you wish for an adjournment before closing? No, my lord. Members of the jury. The two packages before you have passed through many hands, cultures, even continents. And sold on the streets of England, that heroin is worth 200,000 pounds. And the evidence in this trial has been almost as circuitous as the history behind those packages. My learned friend asks you to believe that well-organized professional criminals are behind this smuggling operation. Now we've heard no evidence to verify or dispute this assumption. He has also stated that professionals take no risks. A naive thought. As to the idea that these alleged professionals would at random select a boat, risk discovery, whilst preparing an elaborate a hiding place for the heroine, and then sit back and watch this vessel sail off to any of a dozen ports, possibly the next day or the next week. Well, ladies and gentlemen, 
with the risks and profits involved, professionals are not so careless. The cannabis is easily purchased in England. A two dozen cigarettes would weigh approximately half an ounce. Cost a mere six pounds. Now surely if one was going to the trouble of smuggling marijuana, one would buy half a pound or a pound of it. And I would also submit that marijuana is always sold in its raw state. Not even in the bistros of Cherbourg can you purchase ready-rolled packets of marijuana cigarettes. I put it to you that in attempting to cure the accused of his addiction to drugs, Miss Harley sought to teach him a lesson by informing the authorities that he was carrying marijuana. And when she realized that he was smuggling heroin instead, she felt guilty for her betrayal. And to ease her conscience, she's done everything possible to persuade you of his innocence. In closing, I would add that criminals regularly solicit newcomers. They look for just one qualification, need. Financial, emotional, drug. And I put it to you that Paul Vennings is fully qualified. You have before you motive, means, character, and most damning of all, the fact that he was caught smuggling that pernicious narcotic. I put it to you, ladies and gentlemen, that you have a duty to find Paul Vennings guilty on both charges. <coughs> May it please your lordship, members of the jury, the prosecution have endeavoured to persuade us that Paul Vennings is guilty of knowingly possessing and smuggling heroin. In this intention they have failed, for the simple reason that they have no proof. No proof, no proof at all. In the absence of any proof they have endeavoured by blackening his character and that of his parents to persuade us of his moral inadequacy. Perhaps in the hope that if they throw enough mud, some of it will stick. And this is their entire case. What facts have they placed before us? Only that he went to France in a boat and came back again. On his return, the boat was inspected by the customs authorities and they found some drugs on board. Now, I would remind you, members of the jury, that he made no attempt whatever to evade or resist this search. On the contrary, he cooperated with them as much as anyone could. Now I ask you, members of the jury, what man, knowingly in possession of £200,000 worth of illicit drugs, would calmly sit in his boat and wait for them to be found by the very people who could do him the greatest harm? Is that the action of a guilty man? Some of you may feel that the <coughs> sudden decision of the accused not to attend this court was indicative of guilt. But was it? Was it even a clear-cut decision? Or was it, as his lordship has indicated it might be, a blind impulse, a sudden reaction of a young, vulnerable person taunted beyond endurance and unable to hide his pain? And I would remind you that he will not escape your verdict by running away. You will give your verdict, and when he's found, he will have to answer to it. Now, my friend has consumed a great deal of time and energy in cross-examining the fiancé of the accused. But to what end? I suggest that we waste no more time in speculating about her motives for attending this court, and give our minds instead to the business we are here to decide, which is whether Paul Rennings is guilty of the charges that have been laid against him. Now, I ask you, do you believe that the young man who fled this court in tears would ever summon the nerve to sail up the Thames with a small fortune in heroin on his boat? No, members of the jury, it simply will not do. We are dealing here with a boy. A spoiled and headstrong boy, perhaps, but a boy. A raw individual who could never hope to survive in the world of organised crime. It is the case for the defence that he was an innocent tool used by professional criminals entirely without his knowledge. Everything indicates his complete ignorance of the fact that the drugs were on board his boat. The prosecution's case rests on the single fact that he motored a boat across the channel on which hidden drugs were found. But I say to you, members of the jury, that single fact alone is not enough to convict him. It is up to the prosecution to prove that he was a knowing party to the presence of the drugs. And proof of this they have utterly failed to bring. Thank you, Mr. Fry. <clears throat>
Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this has been a somewhat turbulent case for you to assess. You heard the accused break down under cross-examination, shouting that he wished to change his verdict to one of guilty so as to have done with this trial. Now this could well be construed as a form of confession and you must examine this possibility most closely when considering your verdict. Then, this morning, you are confronted with a situation where the accused has absented himself from these proceedings. I urged you earlier not to prejudge him on that action, and I see no reason to change that advice to you at this stage. Members of the jury, have you reached a verdict on which at least ten of you are agreed? We have, sir. On the charge of unauthorised possession of drugs, do you find the accused guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Is that the verdict of you all or by a majority? By a majority. And what is that majority, please? Ten to two. Thank you. On the, on the second charge of improper importation of goods, do you find the accused guilty or not guilty? Guilty. And is that the verdict of you all or by a majority? By a majority. And what is the majority, please? Ten to two. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. My Lord, uh, I hesitate to make a, a rather unusual request, but in the circumstances... Not every day we have an absentia <laughs> verdict, Mr. Quite Clyde. Now, um, well, what is it you wish to say? Uh, <coughs> there has been a development which I would be obliged if your Lordship would consider in terms of mitigation. It appears that during the juror's withdrawal, uh, the accused telephoned his solicitor's office. He spoke to the senior partner, uh, Mr. Clarkson. He was in a disturbed state and uh, rang off before any clear instructions could be given to him, but there seems to be a strong possibility that he intends to give himself up to the police. A possibility, you say? But it seems that he was anxious, frightened that if he gave himself up, the police might claim that he'd been apprehended. Hmm. So he wishes to liaise with his lawyers first, is that it? I take that to be the case, my lord. Yes. Well, you're right, Mr. Fry. It could be a factor of mitigation. Could be. Very well. I will delay pronouncing sentence for 24 hours Thank until you. this time tomorrow. <clears throat> and let us hope that the young man has come to his senses by then yes. and is present to hear me. Paul Brandon Vennings, you have been found guilty of most serious crimes. Fortunately, you have had the sense to surrender yourself to the consequence of this verdict. Otherwise, I should have pronounced a correspondingly more serious sentence. As it is, I must sentence you to five years in prison. Take him down.